Welcome to Wrestling Changed My Life, presented by Spartan Combat. Before we get to the episode, quick update from the show. Actually, two updates, folks. Update one, we have a new audio documentary in the works. As you know, we've produced The Smiths, Slang Satiev, and now we will be doing a multi-part audio documentary on the great Tony Davis, a national champ for you and I, a state champion for Mount Carmel. This story runs the gamut from the highs and lows through some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago to the top of the NCAA podium. We're going to hit on the Twisters, Mount Carmel, just so many fun topics. I can't wait for you all to listen to this audio documentary series. It will really hit home for the Illinois fans, but we're going to do the best we can to make it appeal to all wrestling fans and all sports fans for that matter. Again, this multi-part audio documentary on Tony Davis will go live in the spring. If anyone listening wants to add their commentary on the great Tony Davis or anyone he's wrestled, please message us on Instagram at Wrestling Changed My Life. Second update, we released a new documentary video on YouTube. It's called All Access Izzy Style Wrestling, where we take you behind the scenes at one of the top wrestling clubs in the country. Go to Wrestling Changed My Life on YouTube to watch the episode now. Now let's get to the show. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is Ryan Warner, your host. Our guest today is Bob Brams. Bob was a highly successful lawyer for the better part of 20 years, working at one of the most prestigious law firms in the United States. He was also a former wrestler, and that really shaped his career progression. But in 2014, he was diagnosed with brain cancer and ultimately went through a number of operations, complications that you can't even imagine. But yet he's here with us today to share his story, and I can't wait for you all to hear it. Before we get to it, a couple quick updates. First, you can go to Bob's website, 1mbbc.com, which stands for One Mission, Beat Brain Cancer, 1mbbc.com, to support his cause. He also wrote a book that's been published by Simon & Schuster. The book is titled Forever Optimistic, Fighting Brain Cancer, Finding Your Best Path, and Leading a Life with Purpose. Really, really enjoyed Bob's uh, conversation here on the podcast, and I hope you do as well. Fan of the week goes to Kyle Paulson. That's Kyle.Paulson11 on the gram. Kyle's an Iowa guy, a former Ubasa Wrestling Club alum. Kyle, thank you so much for listening to the show. We greatly appreciate it. As always, Wrestling Changed My Life is proudly presented by Spartan Combat. Spartan Combat just went live with Donnie Diakamahalas, David Carr, Kyle Dake. All of their gear is now on SpartanCombat.com for purchase. Please go to SpartanCombat.com to support this podcast. Now let's give it up for the great Bob Brams. All right, Kimberly and Bob, welcome to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, I know you've been patient with some of my rescheduling, so I could not be more excited to to have you here. And Bob, I know you mentioned that you wanted Kimberly to start, just to give a little background or exposition, if you will, on uh, on some of the topics we're going to be talking about. Perfect. Okay. 
So I think, you know, Bob had shared with me once, and I think I saw it once since my husband and son were wrestlers that I think it was Dan Gable who said, once you've wrestled, everything in life is easy. Well, he may be right because Bob certainly went through hell and back on his medical journey. Um, as you know, Bob was diagnosed with brain cancer and he's had two brain surgeries, um, one with a serious complication, which basically put him off the planet um, for the winter of 2015. Bob was considered a catastrophic loss. He was like the sickest person on the neurointensive care unit. And Bob had a hemorrhagic stroke, which you're given a 1% chance of surviving this. Bob survived it. Um, and then following that, um, he was on the hemorrhagic stroke. He was on life support um, for about an extra week. And then they took him off and he's had lots of rehab. He um, could barely walk, think, or speak for quite a while. He's had five speech therapists. Um, he has gone through radiation and chemo um, since then. And this was after a second surgery. But I guess the, the first surgery was the, the biggest, you know, catastrophe that we experienced. Um, it was, you know quite a nightmare. And uh, he, he was not, he wasn't looking too pretty. I mean, I didn't even let people come in to visit him, you know, cause he was in such a state. Um, but, you know. Why do you say it was such a nightmare? It, it wasn't, it was a nightmare. Um, it happened about five hours after surgery. You know, it was funny because Bob said to me a couple of days before, Kim, you know, keep your eyes on me. And I'm like, oh, Bob, I don't need to keep my eyes on you. You're going to go to the, you know, neurointensive care unit. It'll be fine. You know, I'll go back and then I'll, you know, come back the next day. Well, I didn't leave right away. And Bob just started doing like these kind of these weird um, movements, you know, like he couldn't get comfortable. And um, finally, I, you know, I'm saying to this nurse, and it was, we had this male nurse that was on duty. And he kept saying to me, no, he's fine. He's fine. You know, this is uh, what happens after brain surgery. Um, and then finally, I said to him, you know, no, I know what's normal. I'm a psychotherapist. I think I know what's, you know, normal behavior. And I said, and if you don't get somebody down here right now, I'm going to scream and wake up this whole effing hospital. Um, and then another nurse came in, maybe it was like the change of shift. And she said, you know, listen to this lady and, you know, sort of all hell broke loose. You know, everybody rushed um, to the scene. And this was like in the middle of the night. And basically a resident came up to me and said, you know, I think you just saved his life um, because I think we were able to catch this bleed. Had we been, I, I don't know, an hour later, I don't know if he would have survived, um, but it was touch and go, you know, the whole time because of the type of you know, hemorrhagic stroke that he had. So, but in any event, he's, he worked very, very hard for a couple of years trying to, you know, get back. Um, he had to go on disability retirement. He was a lawyer um, where he traveled the world. Um, and, you know, and I do think because of wrestling, and just because of the, the shape that, he, that he has always been in and maintained and the discipline that he's here with us today. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Bob, I can't wait to get into the nuts and bolts of this. Kimberly, was there anything else you wanted to share? Nope, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Bob, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good to have you. Let's start at the very first moment you found out about your diagnosis. Where were you? What happened? Let's see. First of all, it was uh, holiday time, and we were uh, one of my partners and I were taking my secretary out for lunch. And so we had lunch. Um, we were about to go out on vacation, and Kim's uncle was chief of neurosurgery at Fairfax Hospital. Uh, um, and he said, you probably should get an MRI. And so I did that because I was still experiencing some tingling from a car accident that occurred 
I was rear-ended on Willard Avenue by a woman and uh, I was trying to take a left turn, but she hit me and it was, I had sort of neck and shoulder pains. And, and, uh, and so that really kind of threw me for a loop. That's why after like three or four days, we got on the phone with Dr. Bortnick, Kim's uncle. And he said, yeah, go get an MRI. So I did, I'm expecting like, uh, you know, some, some muscle pain or something, something that shows like that. But uh, the doctor came to me after my MRI and he said, do you know you have a spot on your brain? And of course, I didn't know I had a spot on my brain, but anyway, man, uh, they actually thought I had a seizure and that was a reason for the car accident. Not true at all. I mean, the woman slammed in me from behind and that's what happened. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been uh, a difficult scenario and but one which from which I've uh, you know surfaced and here I am I'm speaking and that's great uh, I did a lot of work on my speech and so uh, it's it's but I'm I wouldn't say I'm back to normal I'm a new me and I'm working with all the problems with the old new me and uh, but uh, uh, I'm here I'm I'm vertical I'm gonna keep going you sound amazing Bob and you're an inspiration to all of us and it's just an amazing story. And so you, you, you go to the doctor and they say you have a spot in your brain. What happens next? Okay. So uh, we're having a holiday party that night at our house. Okay. So I was hoping to just stop in for the MRI and get it done. Just, just move on. But then the doctor came in. So anyway, we're having this holiday party at the house. And I, I, the doctor comes in, says a spot in the brain. Um, and he, uh, I then call Kim at her house at her party, which is ongoing. And I said, Kim, uh, I, we got a little problem here. I said, you don't have to come down. Um, and uh, I was just kind of hoping it was nothing. I was hoping it was uh, just scar tissue or something like that. But uh, and Kim said, no, I'm coming right down. So Kim actually left our party at our house to come down to see me at the hospital and figure out what's going on. So that was all pretty damn startling. And it was a real shocker for me. And uh, certainly for Kim, they kept me overnight at the hospital. I, you know, I, I think I said, um, uh, I, I, I was hoping, th they thought I had a seizure. That was mm -hmm. the reason that, uh, that I had the car accident. It really wasn't. I mean, I got hit from behind and the person shouldn't have done it. Anyway, but that's kind of how it all happened. It was startling. I'm on the phone with my friends or doctors and talking about it. I have a friend who's lost her eyeball to cancer. And so, and she's an MD. And so we talked a little about it and, you know, trying to give me reassurance. I, I was not, I was not, I was not, I was kind of hoping this would happen. It was kind of a surreal situation that, that, uh, you know, I was thinking maybe it was nothing. And so uh, that's kind of what was happening. And so Kim came down um, <clears throat> and left the party. The party kept going for some reason. Kim, it's, what do you uh, remember about this night? Um, it, it, it was surreal. I remember getting the call and I remember just kind of like walking. I don't think I said anything to anybody. I think I just walked out of our house. Um, what did Bob say to you? He said that they see like a mass on my brain. And so you got to understand a little bit here. My father passed away from a glioblastoma. So here, my dad had a brain tumor. My husband has a mass on his head. What is going on? So it was, I, I was just like in a state of shock, you know, went down to the hospital and, um, you know, they kept him overnight. They put him on, you know, anti-seizure medication, because again, as Bob said, that the, you know, they quite didn't know why he ended up in the ER or how. Um, so, you know, it was just, we were like, okay, wait, is this scar tissue? I think because a couple of years back or no, early in the 2000, was it 2003, Bob? Something like that. 2003, Six or seven. Bob was having headaches and he went and had scans done and they said to him you know were you an athlete you know he said yeah I played baseball I wrestled um you know and they said well I think you have you know some scar tissue 
And they said, you know, come back and, and check it again. Well, Bob didn't check it again for like a couple of years. So a couple of years later, he checked it again. And they said, oh, yeah, it's exactly the same before. It's scar tissue. They never told us to check again. Well, hence 2006, 2000 and December of 2014, whatever this thing was, had doubled in size. It was not scar tissue. Holy smokes. And they've seen it, it all tumor. along. Yeah. For yeah. almost had this thing for a very, very long time. It's so, called an oligodendroglioma, which they're supposed to be slow growing brain tumors. Um, but anything in the brain is not good, you know. Um, and this thing had grown. So Bob, when did you find out that it was it was the worst case scenario? It was cancer and that it was going to be a major life altering event? Well, I, I guess we end up going to um, suburban hospital and getting my MRIs from way back when, from the earliest days. We were lucky we had them. And so the spot they found on my brain this time was in the exact same location as what they found, you know, 20 years ago whatever it was roughly mm -hmm. that time frame so uh yeah so uh you know it was all kind of a shocker and uh you know the, the issues surrounding it all don't really need to be discussed but it was yeah quite quite a shocker and i i wish i'd you know gotten tested back then and um uh, surprised yeah. i wasn't asked to do that and back then i'm kind of like I remember like high five the doctors. They said, yeah, it's definitely scar tissue. I'm like, okay, see you later. I'm going to be told if I'm not being told to come back, I'm not coming back. You know? Right. Right. And it was with top doctors. And so, uh, you know, yeah. the medical profession can be uncertain about certain things. So how long from that point until the first surgery? It was uh, pretty fast. It was, uh, uh, basically less than a month. Yeah. Holy January 13th, I believe it was. So you wake yeah. up that morning of the party, life is normal. The next morning you wake up, it's never the same again. And it's, and it's been a, 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 a new, a new normal since. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely a new me. I'd like to think it's a better me um, with, that little, with all the stress in my life. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So anyway, so after... it's worse in certain ways, it's better in certain ways. Well, after the, so after that incident that you were, that you kind of let off with Kimberly, you know, so you have the surgery, you're going into it. What are the chances of, of coming out in, in, in the clear going into it? Is it a very dangerous surgery oh. to begin with? Well, you know, it's a craniotomy. I mean, basically, yes, it, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous anticipated the reason Bob wanted to have the surgery so quickly is it was my son's senior year in high school and he was captain of the wrestling team and, you know, it was the senior year and he had a match coming up uh, a week later. And so Bob thought that he was going to be at his wrestling match. Um, can, can you guys see this, by the way? Yeah. This is, that's the score on my head. That's from the second surgery. Wow. And that's me in radiation, if you can see that. So we're talking as invasive as it could possibly get in the most sensitive area of the brain of the body. Twice. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, it doesn't even, it's crazy. It doesn't even describe it, but I guess kind of take us through Kimberly, take us through that, you know, that, that minute where you, you flag the nurse, she comes in and says, we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to operate again or, or, or move, you know, take this to the next step. Kind of what happened there and what led to the second surgery? Uh, the second surgery, um, so he, you know, this was 2015 and 2019, um, Bob had an MRI, so he gets MRIs frequently and, you know, cause you have to watch this thing because you can never get it all out, but your best chance of sur survival is to get as most of the tumor out that you can. And so... Kim, excuse me one second. Um, what happened was, Ryan, they do a, like a watch and wait procedure. So they, they did MRIs like every, you know, four months to see what's going on. And then in November 6, 
18, they found the spot. Go ahead, Kim. No, was it 18 or 19? 18. Surgery was on 19. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And right, so do you right. think you're out of the clear in these years between, or is it still touch and go? Well, you never know. every day, every time before an MRI, I'm like, let's hope it's good. I mean, look, I felt fine. I felt fine when it's six brain tumor was six centimeters. It was big. And like, I felt fine then. He was so completely I asymptomatic. Can, yeah. So wow. I can't, I can't tell, you know. And so what happens the second go around? So the second go around, um, we were trying to do our due diligence and um, we have these friends who live in McLean, Virginia, and she has the same type of brain tumor that Bob does. And after Bob's first surgery, there was a brain tumor gala in Virginia at her home. And I was still like shell shocked. I couldn't go. And Bob went and met her and so forth. And so we've been, you know, my surgeon, you got to talk to my surgeon, which is, um, out at UCSF and we um, consulted them. At this point, Hopkins didn't want to operate on him again. They wanted him to do radiation and chemo. So what happened was- Because of the MRI, bleed. Hmm? Because of the bleed. Right, he, because of the hemorrhagic stroke, they didn't want to right. operate on him again. But there was a little bit of this area, they couldn't get all of the tumor out and a little bit of the tumor had enhanced. So when that, so it went from a grade two to a grade three, there's only three stages in these oligodendrogliomas and Bob is in stage three, um, but, or grade three, but you know, that again, that, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's eminent that he's terminal. These things can, you can last for years. They can be managed. you have to watch them. Um, and so we think potentially we found out after the fact that maybe the reason that Bob had this brain bleed is because he's got this type of hemophilia. Um, and so we went out to UCSF because he said, I'll operate again, best chance of survival is to get as much of this out as you can. And they gave him this factor. Bob didn't bleed. So he had this, was able to do a great surgery, get more of this tumor out um, and Bob was probably upstanding that night and he was walking the hills of San Francisco three days later. The second surgery was a walk in the park. It should have been how the first surgery went. Yeah, I was, I, I was actually hoping that I could, after the first surgery, that I could make it to my son's wrestling match on that Saturday. Wow. And that's... That didn't work. That didn't work. Out. That didn't work out too well. He no. missed my son's entire senior year. And I, I, I read it. Yeah, I basically came back to life right before national preps. And Let's so talk. I couldn't. I couldn't go. So sorry to interrupt you, Bob. Let's talk about that moment because I've heard uh, Kimberly. You reference it as, as well as you, Bob. When you say you were pretty much gone that whole winter, what do you what do you mean by that? And what the, what memories do you have of that? Jim, go ahead. Okay, basically, you know cognitively, um, you know, things are sort of distorted. He had, you know, sort of no memory. So he had to sort of be told, you know, what was I doing? Who was I talking to? He didn't remember any of that. He didn't remember anybody visiting. He didn't re remember his parents coming. Um, he, you know, it, it was interesting. The only, <laughs> Believe it or not, the only thing that he would pay attention to or that would spark kind of him to look up as if we put wrestling on the TV. Wow. Wrestling matches. And so then a buddy of his brought this, you know, big wrestling poster that we put up in his hospital room. You know, I mean he was he was talking, a, but it was, it was a Dan Gable poster. It was it was a Dan Gable poster. <laughs> signed wow. by Dan Gable. Yeah, it was signed by him. Yeah. Um, but he was just, you know, he did he know who you were? Yeah, he knew who who everybody was. Um, but he was just kind of, he, he think. wanted to go home. He didn't yeah. understand that he had to stay at the hospital. Um, when people left, he wanted to leave with them. Um, he 
also at this time he had no balance. So he couldn't be, he couldn't walk without assistance. And so he was, you know, in a wheelchair because if he got up, he would have to, you know, have help. And, you know, he's had to be start rehab. He also, he really couldn't talk because when he was intubated, he, his vocal cords, his vocal cords got damaged. And so he was whispering. Mm. Um, so you really couldn't hear him too well. So he couldn't talk. He couldn't walk. Um, you know, he was thinking, but it not like, you know, like he was not aware of, you know, sort of time. There was a time delay. Bob, how do you stay optimistic in a state like that and not just say enough's enough? This is this is too much. You know, I think back then in that state, I'll call the off the planet state. I was um, it's not thinking about being optimistic at that point. I'm just thinking about surviving. And I really do think a lot of things from wrestling, the discipline, you know, the, the mental toughness, all the things you, you hear about and get out as values out of wrestling. I really do think they were a foundation for me that helped me really think through this thing, kind of power through it. So it was just day by day for you surviving. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I really remember, as Kim was saying, I had to ask, like, what was going on? What happened in Garrett's season, wrestling season? Right. Like, <laughs> I had no yeah. idea. He like, could follow directions, but he couldn't, and he could sort of, ha- you know, have a conversation with you, but he wouldn't remember it. And he would ask, you know, sometimes the same thing over again. Um, and, was it a daily reset kind of a thing? Um, a little bit, but not totally. Um, I, you know, by the way, was, I have zero rec- recollection of that time frame. Zero. Yeah, right. right. He was, you know, he was he was agitated too because he wanted to leave. I mean, the, the funny story. One night, and this guy had no idea who Bob was, but he said to me was your husband a wrestler or something? And I'm like, "Hmm, what are you talking about? He said, it took three of us to hold him down the other night because he tried to get up and walk. He (laughs) he got up, he'd fall. And I'm like, (laughs) you know, of all the the sports, I mean, this was before we put the wrestling posters and everything up in his room. But like, that was just bizarre that he said that. Bob, what was the turning point for you to come out of that and get back to uh, some sense of normalcy? You know what? Um, it took me a, a long time because I went to the party, as Kim was mentioning, that was like four months after my surgery. And I recall it was out on the grass lawn of a person's house, a people's house. And I was I thinking I was having a lot of trouble walking. And it's out in grass. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's not an appropriate location for the party because I'm having trouble walking. And all these other people at the party must have trouble walking too. So this is four months later. And like, it took like another two and a half months till I said, yeah, wait, that's not the case. These other people are not stroke victims. So therefore, they didn't have trouble walking in the grass. So it's, it's, it's funny. I wrote, as I wrote this now book, and I was writing, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's like I have a puzzle. I'm trying to put the puzzle together, and the puzzle pieces keep ch- kind of changing shape yeah. as time goes on. And that was kind of what was happening through this whole process. And my writing in the beginning was terrible, and Kim would tell me that, and she goes, "You just can't write like you used to." And that's, of course, I mean, I I wrote for a living, or wrote and spoke and all that stuff, and so it was difficult to acclimate to the fact that my writing was a problem and I had to work hard to write and uh but it was really kind of cathartic for me therapeutic and uh so it was good uh, and did it help you bring things back going through that process yeah I would say it helped me bring things back it it forced me to like when Kim said your writing's not as good as, as before I would sort of deny that and I keep writing to 
try and make it sound better, work better and all that stuff. And so, yeah, I think it was a good exercise to force me to really, um, uh, you know, to improve my ability to write. Yeah. And think through, and think through everything that I've gone through. And you mentioned that before you wrote and spoke for a living, uh, what kind of, so tell us about your law practice and, and, and what kind of law you were in. Yeah. Um, I was involved in like infrastructure development law involving, you know, putting together major projects like airports and tunnels and railways and all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, in fact, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I probably did 35 trips to Doha, Qatar, Abu Dhabi and Dubai. What? And so, yeah, yeah. I, I'd be in Whoa. eight time zones, eight hours away. And, and invariably when you get there, they wouldn't really let you leave because they'd always keep like four days later. So I was kind of prepared for that on the assumption they would make you stay longer. Um, and so, yeah, I was in uh, arbitrations in the Middle East, uh, you know, a number of times and spent a lot of time over there on, on disputes and involving water systems and airports and spent a lot of time involving the Doha, Doha Qatar Airport and uh, we represent the, the, the state of Qatar. In fact, I also represent the state of Qatar on building the new embassy in D.C. at 25th and M. How do you land the, the state of Qatar as a client? Who's, who's making that? cold card that introduction that was another another part of my firm had somehow worked for a long time my law firm patent bogs it's uh um, not you probably aren't familiar with this but tom bogs is you know he's legendary in terms of uh uh working in the lobbying space and and so uh they they worked for a long time in the Middle East. I'm not sure exactly whose connection that was, but it was, you know, 35 years in the Middle East. And um, then this project came up regarding the airport. And so uh, the client went to interview somebody who could do construction law. That was me. So when it, we went over to Doha Qatar, I interviewed, got the, got the project, and then it's been going on ever since. I'm I'm no longer involved because I'm out. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite a project. It's it's a probably a seventeen billion dollar project right now. What kind of it's prep a massive work? Airport. What kind of prep work goes yeah. into that interview when you're getting ready to make your pitch on why you should do the law <laughs> or uh, be the lawyer? Is it just crazy work? You know, uh, you know what I I mean. Uh, um, I kind of know my construction law. I've been doing it for a long time. And that point, it was 20 years into practice. In fact, when I meet people and they tell me they've been doing stuff for five years, I said, I didn't know anything five years. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I, you know, I prepared well for it. And, and, uh, but I, I kind of knew this stuff fairly well. So I didn't have to prepare hard. Uh, I just, what I had in my brains was... Uh, no pun intended. What I had in my brain was, uh, you know, what I need to know for the interview. And Kimberly, what kind of like work-life balance, daily grind was was Bob uh, was Bob exerting when he was in his legal prime? Um, he was never home, <laughs> <laughs> and now he's home all the time. So kind of, hmm, which was better? <laughs> I'm not sure it's sure better. <laughs> and it was just like just nonstop kind of thing from the, from the moment you had met him till. Uh, oh, till the- totally. I mean, we, we would, we would plan vacations and they're about to close the airplane door and Bob's running up the steps, trying to get onto the plane. We would land places. There would be boxes at the hotel already waiting for him. Um, you know, he worked hard and, you know, and it, and it paid off. I mean, he was, probably one of the youngest guys in this before he even went to patent box that he mentioned it was with a Boston based firm. He was probably the youngest partner made at this firm um, when he first started out. And, um, and then he was managing partner of their office at such a young age. And then, um, you know, he just, he worked hard and he was very, 
well respected in the industry. I mean, he was known as one of the top construction attorneys or infrastructure attorneys in the world. Um, there's this very elite directory of the top lawyers. Um, uh, it's called Chambers, and Bob's in Chambers. Wow. Listed as Bob, did you do that. this intentionally? Like when you started, did you know like day one on on the job that you were going to be just the biggest, baddest lawyer in town? Like, did you have that ambition from the start? Um, I didn't really think that way. Um, I guess uh, it kind of evolved. It's like once you got wrapped up in it, you, you kind of kept going. And there's something, I mean, in terms of like finding my passion, which is one of the topics in my book, it's like you need to find your passion. To it. And I, I, I saw a lot about law as being a competitive type thing, like competing for clients, competing against an adversary in, in a case. So was, there's a lot of similarities between wrestling and the competition wrestling and, and law. That's what kind of motivated me. And once you, as you know, like once you're involved in wrestling, you get motivated to win. And I was motivated to win and keep plowing forth. And, you know, they say the law is a jealous mistress. And I guess, I guess it was. Um, and so I just, you know, just plowed forward. I mean, the good thing is, I, I tell my kids like, guys, you, you know, if you want to do well, you really got to put in hard work. And this is the time in your life to put in the hard work. You know, that, that old expression, um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, which I believe as it, it works well as a younger person, but maybe when you're older, like I'm getting to be, what doesn't kill you may make you weaker. It may be having some adverse impact that you're not even aware of. So were you carrying a lot of stress around during that time? Yeah, yeah but it was not, yeah, it was definitely stress. I'd, I'd wake up at, you know, four in the morning, and not so much because um, I had to, but things were kind of going, starting to go on in my head in terms of the way to think about a particular case. So like wanted to get that out on paper, you know, quickly. So I, I'd wake up early and start doing things like that. I, I love that kind of stuff. Just the, the obsessed, the obsessed people in the world are, are very, very interesting to me. And uh, <laughs> I've gotten that way about this. I know exactly what you mean. Um, tell me about the the book and how how that came about in terms of when did you start it and when was it published and, and how did that process go um i started writing as i said i started writing you know i would say it was like five years ago like not all that long you know like a year after my first surgery and it was not intended to be a book i just wanted to, to write and uh and so I did that and started getting more and more down. And I, I recall like rearranging things because it felt like like a book made sense or something longer made sense. And a lot of people were telling me, well, you just write this. And, you know, if you self-publish, that's great. And a lot of people just self-publish. I went to I went to one publisher and they said, we love it. We want to publish it. A place called Skyward Press in New York City. And um Son Schuster, who uh, name you probably mm -hmm. know, is yeah. one that's distributing my book uh, worldwide. Wow! So uh, yeah, uh, and it's uh, a lot of pub a lot of authors go to like hundred publishers and get nothing. <laughs> I went to one. They said, "Yeah, let's publish." Um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> what was your thoughts on the uh, on how did like thoughts on the process from start to finish, Kimberly, of the book? Um, you know, so it's interesting that you asked that a couple things, you know, Bob's had a lot of support with the book just because, you know, he's in a new normal, you know, I mean, he, right. um, so, and I tell him, you know, I lived it and I watched it and like, it's almost like I need a little bit of a break. I need to get away from it a little bit. So I couldn't really help him with it. It yeah. was just too much for me. Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
why would you relive your worst nightmare? You know, yeah, like just it's a just few like, years you know, later. again, yeah, again, again, you know, I mean, I have the story, I know what happened and it's just like, okay, I just, you know, uncle. <laughs> yeah, totally. And when, when did it go live, Bob, the book? Um, it was published, was it the end of July, Kim, 2021, something like that. Uh, yeah. 20, 20. 20? Yeah, can't remember. Yeah. Bob, I wanted to just sign off with with uh, kind of this question of like when you look at this journey from you know, start to finish of your legal career and then this this new, you know, the operation and post, like what did what are the biggest things wrestling's given you and what are you falling back on there? Well, you know, I guess I wrestled for like 13 years, you know, from middle school up through college. I wrestled Leon Valley, Nuremberg College, and um, and my I coached as well. And my son wrestled from like age, I don't know, went to six. Yeah, he's very young, and wrestled uh, in the tougher lease in town. And then he uh, wrestled through middle school, and then he wrestled at St. John's, and he was captain team at St. John's. As somebody mentioned, you mentioned, um, and so. Um, it's, it, but what I've sort of thought about is you prepare very hard for the sport, but there's some matches that are really ones you recall vividly forever. And like, so for example, I was um, in the uh, qualifying tournament for the state tournament, and I was. Um, I was losing the match two nothing, and then um, uh, get him. And so, and my wrestling coach is like, I could hear him saying, "Bob, don't, don't like I'm getting trouble." But I put him in it. He went to his back. I got him on his back. Got three points, and I won three to two. And like, yeah, I remember that to this day, forty five years later. <laughs> And, and my son, he had a match right before my tumor was discovered against a high school American. He was um, he was losing he was losing by one point in the third period, and it was thirty seconds left in the match. You would figure he'd lose, okay? He was on top. He puts the kid in a cradle, puts him on his back, and pins him. <laughs> and so. My son and I have that kind of running joke, like we sort of say what happened in that match, you know, time to gut it out. And so we say that for anything. Yeah, it's a job interview, gut it out. Remember that match. And he will remember that match forever. And it's, it's things like Matt, even though you put in so much time and, and there's so much time, I think, I think sort of moves in the direction of the idea of uh, the discipline that's needed and the mental toughness is needed. And that's just kind of the way I sort of thought about things, having nothing to do with law, uh, nothing to do with wrestling, just right. only law work and all that stuff and everything he does. You know, remember that match and, you know, nothing better than being a high school American. So that's kind of the way I kind of looked at things. And uh, Yeah, Bob was yeah. either traveling with law or he was gone at the, you know, four o'clock in the morning all weekend long with wrestling with my son. So I never saw him. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And she liked it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Are there a lot of uh, former wrestlers in the elite legal field that you were in? Did you ever come across any? Tom Ryan's, you know, Tom Ryan, the coach yeah, of Ohio State, of course. His, his brother. brother, his brother is the uh, managing partner of DLA Piper. Wow. Is that big time? So, yeah, it's great for him. Big for him. And uh, yeah, he was a great wrestler at Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. And then Tom yeah. transferred to Syracuse. You know, it's so funny you say, Kimberly, you mentioned uh, going on vacation, seeing big boxes sitting there. Yeah, I uh, I took the LSAT twice. And uh, the first time was miserable. The second time was okay. And I was obsessed with uh, with David Boyce for a long time and used to listen to all the Supreme Court arguments. And then I read his book. And uh, he talks about- Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, he talks about when he would go on, on Christmas trips with his partner, I believe it was Donald Flexner at the time, but they would like go on vacation to Florida for two weeks, but they'd be reading 
reading all day at the beach. I'm like, who the hell does that? But I guess that's pretty common at those elite levels. I don't think it was vacation I went on where I was not working every day of vacation in some way, in some way. Did you ever think this sucks or would you be loving it the whole time? Oh, no, I thought that kind of sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you step away? You probably had a, enough resources from uh, your years building the ladder. Did you ever think about that? Stepping away or it wasn't in your nature? I, I just didn't, it's not my nature. Wow. Like it had to be done. I recall doing a summary judgment motion from a cruise ship in Bermuda. Kim, remember, you probably remember yeah. that, Kim. Like, yeah. really? I, and it was due on the two days after New Year's Eve. So, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So fascinating to me. Just last thing I got to ask, you know, I'm, I'm crazy on preparation. When you're preparing for something like that, are you visualizing a lot and kind of going through the motion in your head before you get there? For, for what law, for law, for law. Like if you're going to do an oh. argument or you have a big case, like oh, are you going it. through the stuff in your head like crazy? It's a, oh yeah. You have to go through carefully and really read all the cases. The other side of the I mean, you have to be ready for the judge to raise any case that the other party cited, you say, and know it cold. How many cases is that? Like 10 or like hundreds? <laughs> it could be 50 cases. And, and you're, you're studying all 50, and they may raise no case or three cases, but you don't know which one it might be. So you got to know it all. Wow. That is a, that's an intense world. And uh, for any lawyers listening, Hit, hit me up. I'd love to have you on. And I am going to reach out to Tom Ryan's brother. I yeah, really, sure. I will. I really just want to thank you both for your time, Bob and Kimberly. Thank you so much. Kimberly, was there anything else you wanted to add before we sign off here? No, no. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Same question for you, sir. Uh, nothing that I can think of. I, I will say this though. I, I've, I'm on the final stage of my cancer and a lot of, a lot of stress. I'm trying to find new ways to deal with stress and uh, I just look at things positively now, optimistically, and just if I see something bad come down the road at me, I just like want to swish it away and move on forward. And I digest and and things like eating right and all that stuff. Like I'm, I was not unhealthy before, but I'm much healthier now. And uh, all that stuff, you just feel better. Your stomach feels better. Your mind feels better. You think clearer. Well, Bob, however we can help. With uh, myself or the community here, we have listening. There's quite a few people listening on a weekly basis. We're here for you, and, and we're so grateful that you came and told your story. I'm going to publish it today, and uh, you just can't wait to hear the outpouring, and I'll share that with you. And, and again, please consider consider me a friend, and whatever we can do, we're here for you. Ryan, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, it. Ryan. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. To see video clips from this interview, please go to Instagram at Wrestling Changed My Life. This episode was proudly presented by Spartan Combat. The Spartan Combat Nationals are returning to Jacksonville, Florida, April 8th through the 10th, 2022. Register now at SpartanCombat.com.